Good morning. I'm not going to call Patricia out for walking down the, the aisle right now. You're fine. You're fine. That was, that was not a complaint. I'm just giving you a hard time. Everybody does, so I figured I should join in too. <laughs> it is certainly a good day because we are here in God's house together. We have the opportunity to worship him and to uh, seek his face. And so we hope and pray as uh, we're together that you will experience uh, the grace of God, that uh, God's presence will uh, just show you who he is, that will show his goodness and uh, show you who he's, he's calling you to be. Um, we do want to just begin with uh, a couple of announcements. I know one of the things that I have up on the screen there is that we are, um, well not we, the Circle of Hope is actually selling Christmas and Thanksgiving cards, so be aware that those are there uh, in the back. Um, and soon we're going to be moving, it's not on there quite yet, but soon we're going to be moving into the uh, Operation Christmas Child Collection. I think that that's going to be next week we'll be passing out the boxes. So uh, if you want to go ahead and start being uh, purchasing gifts and things to, to stuff those, uh, it would be a, a great way to go ahead and be making preparations for that. Um, and that's what I have for announcements today. Are there any other announcements? I know you've got one. Thank you, Mary, for that announcement. And so um, I will. All right, CE at 3.30. And I'm, that's in the chapel again. Okay, we'll meet in the chapel. Any others? If not, let's go into a, a period of prayer concerns and praises as well. Um, we're going to change up the order of service just a little bit today, so we'll move straight into our prayer from this. Uh, but we wanted to, uh, just a few that I had to mention is we want to continue to remember the Leonard Hadley family as he passed away earlier this week. Uh, the funeral will be here at the church. It'll be in the, at a, a graveside service. It'll be Tuesday at 2 o'clock, and I know the family said, don't, don't dress up, no suits and ties, things like that. That wasn't who Leonard was, and so we want to just honor honor his memory and um, just to invite you to come out and support the family in their time of grief. Um, also got a message, I think Susan shared it with the church family through email, but uh, for, it was from Lisa Hus Huffman asking uh, for prayer for, uh, I think it's her brother Keith, uh, who they've discovered has, has cancer, and so you have uh, Joanne Richardson, her mom, who also has cancer, so just remember that family as they have two individuals that are, are facing cancer right now. 
Um, and then I, I said it, said it earlier in the week, but I just think it bears mentioning again the praise for Aiden Brown, which is uh, Faye Combs' great grandson. They were looking at a spot they thought was cancer in his lungs, and so the doctors have uh, gone back and they can't find the spot now. So we just praise God for that because uh, there are some other spots they're looking at and just keeping an eye on, but um, continue to remember that family. But we praise God that the one that they were concerned about has uh, disappeared at this point. And then they've got a, some of their family that is facing. Uh, that were they tested positive for the coronavirus, so please remember them, um, just some extended family, not Faye and Alfred, but continue to remember them. Are there other prayer concerns and praises today? So that was Ryan Rosamon, uh, who's tested positive for the virus as well. So let's continue to remember William Bear. Unspoken. Absolutely. I know we, we we had a prayer, our own prayer march version out here at the church yesterday, which was, uh, I just praise God for that opportunity to, to pray with other other members of our congregation, but we also had the live stream playing out there, and uh, one of the things I remember them saying on the live stream, is I, either as I walked by or as I was finishing up uh, and stood there for a little bit of time, uh, they were just saying how it is so much negativity right now, and it, and if you go back 40, 50 years, it, it wasn't that way. We, we just are so focused on politics at this moment, and it's just dividing us and destroying any sense of fellowship and community uh, in our nation. So let's uh, pray, for, pray for our nation and pray for opportunities to come together as, as a nation. <clears throat> any others? Well, if not, let's stand, and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer together today. God, first of all, we, we simply want to say thank you. Thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you for bringing us uh, around other believers, other people who uh, just realize that your presence is here. And uh, because your presence is here, something uh, powerful takes place, something that we can't quantify in the earthly realm, but we realize is taking place on a spiritual reality. And so, Lord, as we are here today, we pray that uh, for those that feel away from you, that feel distant, that feel broken down, that feel like uh, life is more than they can handle in this moment, we pray that you will come around them and show them that in those moments you are their strength. You are their hope. You are the one that holds them together when they feel like the world is flying apart. And as we mention these names and acknowledge the realities all around us, we pray that God, you would continue to, to, to shape your church, to be your presence in this world, that as we speak, as we go and serve, whatever we do, we do it in the name of Jesus Christ, that where, where we are going, your presence goes with us and is made known and tangible. So, Lord, as we're here to meet with you today, as we are in this place, uh, just fill us with your presence, fill us with the acknowledgement that you are there and that we may go out from this time later on, empowered to do the work that you've called us to do, empowered and, and, and inspired by your spirit to love in ways that we can only love because Jesus first loved us. Lord, we lift up these names that have been mentioned for these families. Uh, Father, for, for a family that grieves right now over the loss of a, of a brother, we, we pray that you'll uh, just surround them in their hearts, that you will, will let them know that you're there with them and that uh, you grieve alongside them, just like you were grieving uh, with Mary and Martha. That you come to us in our, in our times of need. So, Lord, we thank you that you're already there. Lord, for this family that has had multiple instances of cancer now, finding out a son and a brother are 
uh, ha- that, that he has cancer. We, we pray that you will uh, just hold them together, that you will draw them together as family, that, that they can support one another and uh, realize that your presence is, is guiding them and guarding them. Father, for these individuals that have tested positive for the coronavirus and uh, the, the many ways that it affects us and, and the fear that's all around us because of it, we pray that uh, we would continue to look to you and, and to, to have peace. But we pray for these individuals that they would be strengthened by you, that, that recovery would come quickly and, and that every need that they have would be met by you. Father, we give you praise for the, the re- report of a young boy that uh, had, a, had a spot that disappeared that was, uh, the doctors were afraid was cancer. So we, we thank you for that and we pray as he continues to undergo uh, testing and monitoring that you would protect him and guard him. Lord, for William Bear and what he's facing, we lift him up uh, for the unspoken prayer request and what it, the, that particular one, but the many others that are here today, things that we just couldn't mention uh, because we don't have the words or we don't even know it right now. Lord, we, we pray that you will show your goodness in each and every one of those instances, that you will bring healing, that you will bring comfort, that your presence will overwhelm uh, each of those circumstances. And so, Father, we give you praise for the prayer march yesterday, for the opportunity to pray for our nation in the many different ways uh, that we prayed for it, to, to see your, uh, your people come together and, and to, to seek to be a positive and uh, uh, to be light in our world. We are grateful for that. And so we pray that you will help us today to continue that as we are here today to worship you, to lift up the name that is above every other name, that of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we pray this all in his name. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm going to read our our first scripture for today. It comes from Isaiah chapter 1, and it's verses 10 through 20. And uh, something that I don't do very often, but I, I have come to appreciate more uh, liturgies. I know that that's not something we as friends have done, but I want to invite you uh, following this because as you, as you read the scripture, I believe that it's an invitation to confession. And, and so we're going to just take some time as a, as a prayer of confession today, uh, just arising out of our, our scripture reading that, that God invites us to, to pour out what's in our hearts, uh, whether it's sin, whether it's our uh, just circumstances that we face, that God invites us to pour those things out uh, because he never intended for us to carry it. Uh, he, he said that we're supposed to cast our cares upon him. And so that's why uh, following the reading of our scripture, we're going to go into a period of confession, a prayer of confession. And I'm going to invite you to participate. I hope that you can tell the difference. Uh, there's some bold print. And whenever it's bold print, I want to invite you to uh, join in reading those, those words uh, that will be as a part of the, the prayer of confession uh, following the scripture. So... Let me first read our scripture from Isaiah 1, verses 10 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instructions of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins be, are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I want to invite you now to join me 
in, in a prayer of confession. And like I said, I will read the, the regular print, and then I ask you if you see the bottom line there hey, is a bold print. So join me together for a period of prayer. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, He will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for Him. Dear Jesus, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Please forgive my disobedience. I want to be a Christian in my actions. I want to be a Christian in my words. I want to be a Christian in my whole life. So at this time, I invite you to just take a little bit of time to confess uh, your sins, to confess those things before God that separate you from Him. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you. Take very many, it can be just too. 
Our second scripture today comes from James chapter 1, and it's verses 18 through 27. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect wall that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This time I'll invite, I want to invite you to join together for a period of open worship.
Father, I thank you for these words of Scripture. First, the reminder that you chose us. You chose us, that we are not an accident, that where, where we are and what's going on is not something that has overwhelmed and, and prevented you from working, but you have chosen us and you have called us by your word. You've called us to something greater, something that we could not do on our own, but something that you desire to empower and build in our lives through, through us spending time with you and in your word that, that you long to, to do more than we can do on our own. God, I thank you for that reminder that you chose us, that we sit in here not out of accident today, that every single one of us is in this place for a purpose and for a reason that you have anointed this day for us to be with you. You chose us. And this word was anointed and, and chosen for this day that, that we acknowledge that long before we were here, long before we set onto the scene, God, you had plans in place and that you have been doing something, something that we haven't been able to see, but we trust that you are about. God, the fact that we are able to open up these scriptures, this word, and, and to read it, that, that long before we were on this earth, you, you preserved it. And you have sustained it along the way so that we can take and read it today and it can change our lives because it is your heart being expressed to us. A heart that is for our good, a heart that is calling us to life. And so, Lord, as we look into this word, as we look into the letter that James wrote to a group of, of Jewish men and women who were living spread out away from everything that they knew and were comfortable with, we, we thank you that you are able to speak through it today, that your Holy Spirit comes around us and, and encourages us and empowers us to be the people that you've called us to be, to be more than we could be on our own. So God, we pray that our hearts, our minds, our ears would be receptive to what you long to say today, to what you long to do, that you have, have a purpose and a plan for each and every one of our lives, that you are doing something today. So we thank you for this. We thank you that your heart is for us. And in that, it is good. Your heart is good. Your love is good. So may we hear, may we listen, may we receive from you today, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yesterday, after the, the prayer march that we had out here, Mary had dropped me off earlier in the morning, but yesterday, after we'd finished up, I, I had the, uh, the, the privilege of being picked up by Janie. Mary brought Janie uh, to, the, to the church to, to pick me up, and uh, the, the reason that was such a privilege is just to have her, her greeting. She has so much excitement and so much love in her heart, and uh, in that greeting, uh, the, the first thing that I hear is, Andrew, I have apple seeds to plant. She uh, she had had an apple for lunch, and she was so excited about the seeds, she found it in there. And so we ended up taking them home, and we uh, found a little cup, a, a cup that we were going to recycle, and put some uh, soil in there, and we prepared it. And uh, she got to plant those apple seeds, and so now they're they're sitting on our our counter, and we're going to see what comes out of those apple seeds. We we don't know yet if. Uh, those. I know it's, it's really hard to start trees and things like that, but I, I just loved in that moment the excitement that was in her heart to, to, to see that, that the, the fruit of God's love in her heart, that uh, she, she has such excitement for life and such excitement over what seems like such a small thing. Those apple seeds are really small. I mean, let's be, let's be honest. And yet she had such a, a delight in those things. And so it, it starts to give us a picture of what James is trying to say in verse 18. I realize we talked about that last week, but we're going to come back there because it, it shapes everything that we're going to talk about today. This idea of him choosing to get God choosing to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits. That's the word I want you to hold on to is this idea of being a first fruit. And so what does it look like to be a first fruit? 
What, what does it look like for that seed of God's word, the word of truth being planted in our lives to grow? And also, as we get into the scripture, we're going to see also what it's not. It's not just straightforward. This is exactly what to do. It's also given us some warnings, things that we don't want to put into place in our lives because that's not the kind of thing God desires for us. And, and so as we think about this idea of the seed, it's understanding that God is casting seed last year. I think it was last September, October, we were looking at the parable of the sower, looking at those different soils. And so throughout scripture, you get this illustration of seed and how important they are uh, to pay attention to. And, and so the seed today we're talking about is the word of God and how the word of God is at work. I hope, I hope you believe that this still works. That God is doing something through this. It, it, it is not an accident that we hold this in our hands today, that we're able to read it, that, that God is doing something. He continues to work through this. It's not a mistake. God is at work through his word. And so when the word of God is planted in our heart, just like those seed, we planted them in the soil. It is intended to do something in our lives. It is intended to bring about something that God desires to do. God is planting that seed every time we pick up the word and on Sunday morning, but every time, even more, every time we pick up the word throughout the week and we take time to read it, God is planting something in your heart. God is trying to do something that only God can do. I, I, I so often get it wrong because I go back and think, all right, it's what I'm going to do. It's about how good of a sermon I'm going to preach. It's about how, how good of a devotion I'm going to have, how, how much time I'm going to do. No, no, it's not about that. It's about what God does. It's about the work of God's word in our lives that each and every one of us, is, as we take and we can be like that soil that Janie put those seed in yesterday, we let our lives be a receptacle for what God is trying to do. So God's word is at work, I hope that you believe that. And so we want to see what those first fruits are. This scripture today, as I was talking with Mary about it, and we were trying to figure out what direction to go, this scripture seems so disjointed. I mean, even James, he jumps metaphors right in the middle of, of, of what he's saying. It, it, it's Honestly, I apologize because I know a lot of times my sermons can be that way too. So, so maybe you're, you're sitting under a, a lesser of James in, in, in ways, but... Uh, he, he jumps, and it seems so disjointed, but the flow and the understanding I want you to grab a hold of is that God is doing something. He is planting the word of truth, and that we might be the first fruits, and we want to see what the first fruits look like and pay attention to that reality. And so we see the word working us out on three different levels. As we go through, we'll see these different levels. First off, as we get in there, we're going to see how it works on a personal level between us and God. It starts to work in that way that our relationship with God is being shaped. Then, then there's an internal way that God is trying to shape us individually, that he is doing something in our lives. He is trying to create a, a reality out of our everyday existence. And then the third way is that it starts to flow out to others. I, I love illustrations I've heard in the past. Whenever you think about a cross, that, that the cross expresses how God's love is multidimensional, that there is the vertical piece of the love of God that flows down from heaven, and there also are the arms of the cross that is meant to be reaching out. And so if we're going to live out the fullness of being first fruits of God, we've got to embrace all of the levels, all the levels. We can't just pick and choose, oh, this is my favorite. I love the times of worship. I, I, I love the task of preaching and, and neglect the other things that God is calling us to. We have to embrace the wholeness of what God is doing. That's why we read the full counsel of the word of God. See, we, we have favorite places. I have favorite places of scripture, and I'll, I'll outright tell you some of the, the favorite scriptures I have, but we don't want to go to those places to the neglect of the whole word of, and counsel of God because God is saying more than just what our favorite thing is. God is trying to shape us in a way that he brings about good in our world that is extending out to everyone we meet. And so the work of God's word is to grow God's heart in us. At its most basic form, the work of this word is to grow God's heart that we would meet with God. We would know what he cares about. Is, and, and part of the reason we read Isaiah at the beginning is it has so many overlaps here with James. James was shaped himself by the, old, the, the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures that we call. I've been challenged by a, a preacher out in Nashville to start, stop calling it the Old Testament because that makes us think that, well, it's old. We, we don't like old things. 
So we, we don't need to pay attention. Let's just go to the New Testament, the Old Testament. Uh, he, he challenges to call it the Torah, which is, is the, the Hebrew name for the, the first five books. But those teachings, those things that still speak today, that shape James, that shape Jesus, that God is calling us to be shaped by today. So the work of God's word is to grow God's heart in us. And we saw that in both of the scriptures. James is not just showing up out of nowhere and saying, all right, you need to do this there at the end, as we read, religion that our God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless. Is this. It's not just that James is all of a sudden discovering this reality. It's something that's been taught to him throughout time because he's opened up God's word. He knows the full counsel of God. He knows what God is trying to do, what God has been saying, that, that we, going all the way back to the beginning in the garden, we are meant to be co-creators with God, to, to make more than we could do on our own. We are in, invited to join in with God's heart for the world. To be shaped and to do what God is calling us to do. So the work of God's word is to grow God's heart in us. So we get in here that word first fruits. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. The idea of first fruits. I want you to take hold of that word and, and realize if you want to know what the first fruits are, our, our greatest example is to look to Jesus. First fruits for a Christian is to look to Jesus, to look at the life he lived, to look at how he interacted with everyone that he interacted with. Because the reality, when we talk about this idea, the word of truth, it is encompassing the heart of God. And, and, and we see the, the, the most reliable resource to knowing the heart of God is here in the word. But the clearest picture that we've ever been given of the heart of God is Jesus Christ himself. And so when we are called to be a kind of first fruits, it's that we are being called to model our lives after Jesus Christ. And so as we get in this, uh, this scripture, as we go throughout this, what seems disjointed and understanding what first fruits looks like, we're being called to act more and more like Jesus, to shape our lives after the life that he lived so that we can be those first fruits for the generation today. I was reminded yesterday, I, I, I loved having the opportunity to see uh, Charles and Carmen brought their, their grandchildren out here and we saw several other, uh, other younger ones out here. Just the reminder of what we're doing today. What we were doing yesterday was praying for our nation because we're going to be handing this nation to that generation. We're, we're going to be, as, as, as adults, we're going to be giving them what is re reality today. And that's not just a nation thing, that, that's also a church thing. We're called to be a first fruits and we're going to be handing this faith to the next generation. So those of you that have children or grandchildren, we are handing them our faith. We are passing them something that they are going to live out for their good or also for their bad. And so we want to be those first fruits of all he created. This is why we hold to this word. We're hopeless without this. We're lost without this because God uses this when his Holy Spirit comes around us and that we become a first fruits of what he has created. Not by our words, not by our actions, but because he is at work in it. He is doing something that only he can do. So let's pay attention now to what James is saying in this first section of Scripture, looking at verses uh, 19 through 21. This first level, the relationship between us and God. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. And that, that's a word right there. I'm going to stop for just a moment. That word righteousness. It's, it's fallen out of popular use. It's not one that we think about very often. And I, I would say that even in church circles, we, we don't talk as much about the idea of righteousness. And, and I want to hit a little bit more later on about what I, I, how I see righteousness play itself out in our lives and why it's so important. But we have to be seeking the righteousness that God desires. Not of righteousness, oh, I'm good, everything's okay. The, the, the general reaction we have when somebody asks us how things are going, oh, I'm all right, I'm fine, things are okay. No, we, we want to be based and solidly on God's word and having the righteousness that God desires grow in our life because it's what he has planted there. And so James gives us help in how we see this come about. First, if we're going to do anything to, to have the righteousness God desires produced in our life, we've got to get rid. 
Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. Those words, get rid, I'm, 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 I want to linger there for just a moment because they are very strong words. It's not just tolerate the evil in your life. Let, let these things dwell in your life a little bit longer until you get so uncomfortable with it. We need to get rid of them. They are weeds. They are robbing our lives. Anything that is taking us away from God, that is taking our focus away from what God is calling us to do, we need to get rid of it. It's moral filth that's evil and it is killing us. Instead, we were given the remedy. Humbly accept the word. Humbly accept the word. Be a people who are able in that word. Humbly. I think that that's such an important piece that, that, that we say whatever God is saying, we're going we're gonna to accept it. We're going to do it because God knows better than we know. God understands better than we understand. So when we get rid of the moral filth and we humbly accept the word, we start to see the righteousness that God desires be produced in our life because God is at work through the word. God says that it's going to go forth and it's going to produce the things that he's called it to produce. So we get rid of the things that are distracting us from this and we accept it into our hearts and we let it speak. Let the word take root in your life, just like the seed we started talking about. Let it take root. Get rid of the things that are separating you from God, the things that are taking your attention, that are stealing your joy, and focus on God's word. Get alone with God's word. If it means having to turn off the TV, I got in trouble this week for, for, for having my phone out in the middle of a conversation I was having with Mary. Maybe it means turning off your phone or your computer or whatever it is that has so much of your attention that is distracting you from even giving a few moments alone with God. Turn it off. Accept the word because here is life. Do we believe it? Do we believe that this is life? And we see the second part of it, which can save you. This word is able to produce salvation in your life. It produces righteousness. It grows something that you can never grow on your own. You can't live the life God has called you to live without God's presence in your life. So when we talk about God's righteousness, it doesn't come from us. It's not our good deeds so that no one may boast. As Romans says, it's through the blood of Jesus Christ who has died for our sins to, to take them away. But this word, as we've talked about, it's antiquated, but it's still important. We've got to get back to holding to the righteousness that God desires for our lives. Because when we think about righteousness, this is the image that I have. I, I had the opportunity whenever I worked at Siler City Elementary, I, you would think it's crazy to... Uh, to, to pull out a bunch of bows and arrows with, with fifth graders and fourth graders and, and teach them how to, to, to shoot a bow and arrow. But I had the opportunity with one of the other teachers to, to teach them. And I was learning myself. I was more there just as like another adult because can you imagine 20 fifth, fourth and fifth graders with bows and arrows uh, after school? It's, it's kind of nerve-wracking. Uh, bless you, Angie, for allowing that club to happen. But there's, there, there's something that's so great about the, 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 the discipline that a bow and arrow places in your life, that you are being trained uh, in how to do it properly. That was one of the most important things. If, if you were not listening, you were out. You were gone. You, you couldn't stay around. But, but what I love and why I think that the example of a bow and arrow is so important is because when you point the bow in the right direction, it's going to head in that direction. When, when we allow God's word to direct our lives, our lives are going to head in that direction, just like as it, God is just setting us off in, in a certain path. But we want to make sure we're following the course that God has for us, that we're letting his righteousness shape us and send us out into the world. Not us, not what we've done, but God's word and the truth that is present in God's word because it's God's heart. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's learning to model our lives after that so we want to be heading in the right direction in our relationship. Then we go on. Do not merely listen to the word. Ooh. Let me read that again. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. I hope that grabs your attention. 
Don't just listen to the word. I, I can be just as guilty of anyone else. Getting my, my Bible reading in the morning, it sometimes can just devolve to, all right, let's get through this. Let's get it done. That's not listening to the word. That's not giving it time to speak and do what God is calling it to do and asking for it to do. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. The word that I'm going to bring out in this section is obedience. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. We're supposed to look into the word. We're going to see that illustration as, as James just completely flops and, and, and jumps his metaphors right at this point. He's saying that if we read the word, if we hear it and we just let it go, go over our heads and go past us. Sorry, I'm about to call. <coughs> I apologize. If we, we just let the word come at us and we don't sit under the word and let it speak, we're like this person that they look at it and then they just walk away from the mirror forgetting what they look like. Had no effect, no, no reality. And I can understand that because there's been times like, you know, we'll be hanging out with, with Murphy and Janie or some other kids and they'll like put a sticker on your face or, or you'll put a hat on and you just forget about it, don't you? Yeah, and you, you don't realize it until you've gone about an hour and people have been looking at you like funny, like, what in the world is that person thinking? We can do it, though. It's not just something that we, we, we do physically. It's something we can do spiritually that we, we, we let it come at us and then we forget what it's supposed to do. Instead, here, here's what James tells us to do. But whoever looks intently, I love that word, intently. The time that you spend looking at God's word is not an accident. It's intently, it's, you look at it with a purpose that there is a plan in that word that God is doing something through that word into the perfect law that gives freedom. This is not meant to be something that's a slavery. It's not meant to be something that, oh, yeah, we got to go to church today. Oh, I don't want to be there. This is supposed to be about finding freedom, people. Finding freedom and the only one that can truly give us freedom, God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, inviting us to resurrection life here in this world. So we look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continue in it. Not starting, not, not getting in the process and then, oh, this is too hard, this is too difficult, I, I can't keep going, I've got I, to change my priorities for a season. But we want to continue in it. We want to obey in a long direction, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. Once again, we see this idea of that we have to obey the word. And the result is that they will be blessed in it. Well, that, okay. The word produces blessing. As we spend time in this word, we, we, we learn to experience the blessings of God and we so often get those wrong because we, we try to measure God's blessings based off the ruler sticks that the world uses. Do we have more in the bank account? Do we have uh, better and better cars and homes and opportunities and experiences? We, we measure blessings based off of the things this world measures blessings when God measures blessings based off of the relationship and the closeness that we have. The, the, the ruler that God has is, it uses with, with blessings is about how close we can be to him. How, how close we can be in our relationship with him. That is the truth of God's blessing. You've been given a choice, though. Here, here's where James is saying you've been given a choice. Are you going to be obedient? Or are you going to resist what God is doing? Well, let, let's just think about it in real life. Talk about doing it. Well, with some of the examples that we see in here are being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Jumping back to those verses, because I didn't really hit them very hard, but I think that they are important. I, I know that those words step on my toes. Because I'm often quite the opposite. My, my, the way I would read if it read of Andrew, that he is slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to become angry. Are, are we willing to be obedient, to learn to follow the patterns of God so that we may, might experience the blessings of God? So that's one. What about where, where God says that we're called to forgive? The Lord's Prayer says that we forgive others if we have, as we have been forgiven. 
or, or we're going to go on in just a few moments and we're going to see about holding our tongue. There's actual examples. Are we obedient to those things that God is telling us through his word? Will we be obedient to receive the true blessing, which is intimacy with God? Intimacy with God and restoration with other people. This is, this is about as that righteousness of God that he puts in that first section when we experience salvation takes root in our lives and starts to, to change and mess with how we interact with people that, that, and, and how we uh, treat our relationships, our families, parents, that, how you treat your children, uh, sons and daughters, how you treat your parents, that this word is meant to impact how we live our lives, doing what it says, it's kind of like, let me see if I can get that picture to come back up. I may, I don't know, I don't know why, there we go. It's kind of like one of the things Mary and I talk about every once in a while is we'll, we'll go to an expert, dentist, doctor, everybody knows that you go to the dentist, and, and at least for mine, I, I'm not a big fan of flossing. I don't know about you, there, there are others out there, and there are probably those of you out there like, ugh. Whenever I say that, it's just not, a, I'm not a big fan of flossing. And so every single time I get the reminder by the dentist, you need to be flossing. But I go about, I leave from the place and I'll floss every once in a while. If I have something going on that I, I like, I've got something in between my teeth, I, I might, I, I'll, I'll pull it out at that point. Y'all didn't expect y'all were going to get this today, did you? <laughs> Le learning far more than you wanted to learn. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> the expert said what needs to happen. You need to floss. You need to brush your teeth. I don't have a problem brushing my teeth. That's, that's something I was, I was trained as a child and did and ne never really resisted that. The expert says to do something and then we walk away and we don't listen. That's what we do with the law. That's what we do with God's word whenever we don't take it and obey it and follow it and spend time learning what God is saying through it. And then this last section, this, this seems like it's a tack on section, but I believe it's where, where the rubber hits the road in this whole section is the word of truth makes a difference in our lives. Those who consider themselves religious. Think about it. Do you consider yourself religious? Do you consider yourself to be faithful? Do you consider yourself to be a, a person that is obedient to Christ? And yet, do not keep a tight rein we're going to look at the image of what that is in just a moment. Tight rain on their tongues, deceive themselves. Going back to that word that we deceive ourselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. See, the, the reality is, as we spend time with God, as we let our relationship with God change who we are, how we interact with other people, as we learn to hold our tongue, as we learn to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, the Word actually begins to produce fellowship. It produces deeper and deeper community that, that, that we look around, and the people that are around us, we want to be around, and they want to be around us. The, the word at work in the community of the church, it produces fellowship. It, it starts to get its own gravitational pull and people want to be around uh, the, the, the church because these people, they're being changed by the word. They're, they are people that are full of life and full of hope because they spend time with God. They, they, they see the blessings of God, that they have this intimacy that, that they, they've spent, the people have spent all their time trying to build the bank account or, or, or get the house or get the promotion or get all these things that this world says is important and they still can't find the peace and the joy that a believer has as they have committed themselves to God's word. They still can't find it and they look to the church. Hopefully they're looking to a church that does have that blessing of God, that intimacy, that they, they, they do have that righteousness and salvation that stands out against a world that is perishing. And they see a fellowship and they want to be a part of it. It's about being in community with others. See, the, the picture is actually the, the horse's bridle, that, that there's a rein, that you put this over the head of a horse and you're able to direct it. You're able to control it. And, and I had a youth, I worked with a youth pastor at one point, and he actually had, when, when people said negative words about each other, they would have to put a, a quarter in a, in, a, in a jar, 
and, and that, you know, sometimes people have like swear jars or things like this. Well, they, you know, they had like a negativity jar, and, and it actually got to a point in that group where, where they would say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and put a dollar in because this one's going to be worth it. They weren't keeping a tight rein. It was, it was about wanting to have something to say in that moment, being quick to speak instead of quick to listen and slow to speak. That God is calling us to practice self-control, that, that we don't have to have the final word because he already has. In an argument, in whatever's going on, in whatever relationship I have, I don't have to have the final word because God already does. I realize it's not worth fighting about because the relationship that I have with other people is worth my opinion, worth more than my opinion. I don't have to have the final word. And the other thing I think about that, the image, is that whenever, whenever we accept that bridle, when we accept, when we stop fighting against God and what God is trying to do, we can work so much more and accomplish so much more than we could on our own. And so this relationship that we have with God, as we let the word of truth be planted in our lives, it starts to change us from the inside out and it starts to affect the, the reality around us. And I've actually asked Mary, I know we're short on time, but I've asked Mary if she would share a particular story. She was sharing with me a while back uh, an experience that they had in their organization she works for in Ashboro. Because uh, I think this highlights so well the power of the word of truth. You can come up here. I don't know if y'all are familiar with what um, we do, the organization I work for, but we are for young women and young men and older women and older men, too, um, that are in really destructive habits, um, that are in really fractured relationships, that a lot of them come in because they're in an unplanned pregnancy, and um, they come in very scared, and they come in... Um, just really broken people from, <clears throat> excuse me, from really broken homes. And so um, over a year ago, we had a young lady come in. Um, typically, they start just seeing if they are pregnant. So we scheduled her a pregnancy test, and um, she, it was positive. And she had such a rough, rough persona. Um, she she uh, met with our client services director, who is an individual who will tell you the truth and it is packaged in all the love and grace that it can be. And so she told, um, she told our client services director, Miss, I know what I'm going to do when I leave here and there, nothing, nothing you're going to tell me is really going to change that. Um, because what we do is we try to navigate them, educate them, and then navigate them to choose life for their babies. And so... Um, the client services director did everything that she could, told her everything to expect, um, just poured love into her life. Um, the young lady left. The young lady had an abortion. Um, and then fast forward um, to recent, in recent months, um, this lady calls us back. And she needs to come in for a pregnancy test. And so um, we put her on the phone with our client services director. And um, the first thing our client services director asked, because she's tried to keep in touch with this girl throughout this whole process, she asked, why, why do you want to come back here? Like, you know, why would you want to do that? You know, because, because our client services director told her the truth. Um, the truth was hard for her to hear at that moment in her life. And she, our client services director, was talking to us, the staff, about it and said that when she asked this young lady that question of why she wanted to come back to us for a second time after she had already had an abortion the first time, she said, Miss, I know that you love and care about me because everything that you told me that would happen was true. As much as I didn't want to admit it, it was true. And so I want to come back here because I know you love me enough because you actually cared for me because it was true. You're the only person that told me something was going to happen. And so she is pregnant, and she is planning to keep this, this child. And we, you know, we have 
abortion recovery and things at our office um, that women go through and men go through that, that as well. But there was such power in the fact that even though at one point in her, in her journey, she was so hard to hearing the word of, of truth uh, from the gospel, we pour in the gospel and everything that we do, um, that drew her back. That was the very thing that drew her back is the love and the power of the gospel. And so that, that's the story that um, Andrew wanted me to share. I wanted you to hear that because I also want you to understand that that's how God loves us. That, that God confronts us with the truth. That, that when we open this word and God is confronting us and showing us sins, it's about God's love for us, that he doesn't want us to experience the fractured, broken lives that we could continue living into, but he has called us instead. Going back to verse 18, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits. You're the first fruits. The life that you live this week, somebody is going to see. And, and the way you face it, it's either going to point them towards God or it's going to point them away. And so this is why it matters. This is why it matters because you are the first fruits. You are the ones that are showing the goodness of God because you believe the goodness of God is at work. You believe that God is doing something that only God can do. God's word, it works. I hope you still believe that. I hope you trust. That's one of the things that we hold as evangelical Christians is that this word is powerful. This word reveals the heart of God. And it's, we most clearly see the word of God in Jesus Christ. If we submit ourselves to it, if we say, you know what, God, I, I don't necessarily agree with everything that's in here right now, but I trust you and I trust that you're saying it for my good, that God will do something that only God can do. God will produce something that we can never produce on our own. It is something that he will do in tow because it's something he will do. He will receive the glory. He will receive the honor. He will receive the praise. So I want to invite you to stand and we're going to close in prayer. If you've got your word with you, if you've got a Bible there, if you have your Bible on your phone, however, I want you to I want you to hold it in your hand. I want you to have it close by. Because I want you to realize this, this is where God's saying, I love you. I love you enough that I don't want you to continue living into broken patterns. I want you to experience life and life abundant. So let's take a moment and pray together. God, I thank you for your word. Your word is life. Your word is intended to, to bring about life in us. Your word is intended to create your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And so, God, I pray for your people today. If, our, if we have our Bibles with us, I pray that we just uh, realize the, the gift that it is. That it is a gift because it's something that we hold that we didn't have to have. Lord, it's a miracle that we hold the Bibles in our hands today. But, but God, I pray that we understand the gift that it is because it calls us to be like your son, Jesus Christ that we might experience righteousness that's not our own, a righteousness that is given by grace through faith in Him. That, that we might experience that salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, whatever we have holding us back, Lord, we, we cast it aside and we, we, we let it be covered under the blood of Jesus Christ so that we may walk faithfully with You and, and, and in moments that we may run with all of our heart towards You and towards the world that's perishing because we love You so much and this Word has made such a difference in our lives that we can't bear to see people live broken, destructive patterns. God, may your fellowship come and dwell in this place because we, we gather around this word realizing that these are words of life. May we treasure this. Not being like James says, ones that hear the word and turn away, not paying attention to it and forget what it says. Just like we can look in a mirror and forget what we look like. May this word be about transforming our lives because we treasure it. We believe that it still speaks and it still does a good work in us today. So, Lord, as we go from this place, give us a desire for the true word. Give us a desire for your presence that in all that we do, all that we say, your word may flow from us. If we hold our tongue, we hold it for your glory. If we speak, we speak for your glory and the words of truth that you've given us. If we hold our anger, Lord, we, we hold our anger because your love is so much more important. 
when we choose to, to love those that are the least of these, the, the orphans and the widows, the ones that have no defense of their own, may, may we realize that you're about building fellowship and building a better world for everyone, everyone, no one excluded. Every one of us is invited into this fellowship because of your word. And so, Lord, may your word speak to us, not just this morning, but throughout this week. May we have a hunger to pick it up and to read it and to let it change us. Because it's something only you can do. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.